Welcome to this. It's wonderful to see such an interest in Charlie's things. Um, I should just explain uh, that Paul wrote um, uh, Charlie's biography. He's one of the leading uh, music writers in the world and um, was also one of the th reasons he's great is because he loves his subjects. And, he was, and, and I think he, in studying Charlie, became, uh, you know, realized what a great fellow he was. And I think in understanding Charlie's character, you'll understand what some of these things are. Dave. Uh, Green is, we're very pleased that he could come today. He's not only child, Charlie's childhood friend, but also to, they studied music together. And when Charlie wasn't um, uh, being a Rolling Stone, the other thing, or collecting books or jazz memorabilia, he would go out and do these small boogie woogie shows with the A, B and C of boogie woogie. And uh, Dave Green was A, B, C and D because Dave was played with Charlie for, for, for many years. And so knew him both as a friend and uh, as a musician. So that uh, puts everybody into context. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about uh, Charlie and, ha and his collecting habit. And uh, also then at the end, if anybody's got any questions, we're sort of happy to sort of answer those. So perhaps um, I should start with you, Paul, and ask really, what do you think was the thing about Charlie? What, what, what's the thing about his personality that really strikes you as sort of being great? Well. Charlie, uh, I'm sure you found the same, I'm sure we all did, you know, that uh, he, was, he was a person that took a while to get to know. I mean, I've, I've been so lucky, it turned out that, you know, having met him the first time in 1991, um, I then was kind of invited back, and not just by him, but by all of the Stones for, you know, pretty much everything they've done in terms of records and tours um, ever since, working on, you know, interviewing them for either newspapers or magazines or for radio shows or, um, you know, various different opportunities. Um, the, that first time was when, and Dave will remember this, when um, f f uh, it was for the reissue of the, um, the, the Ode to a High Flying Bird, the book, the little picture book that Charlie had written mm -hmm. right. about his hero, Charlie Parker, when he was at art college. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a reissue of that album in 19, or the reissue of the <clears> book, <throat> I should say, in 1991, and they made a mini album, Dave being a distinguished member of that little quintet, I think. Quintet, quintet yeah. 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 Um, and Charlie, to my subsequent amazement, when I look back, I think he actually agreed to do promotion for this. Promotion is not a word that Charlie would have <laughs> ever chosen to, to be associated with because he would much rather just be talking about his, his own favorite music, I always thought, um, rather than promoting something of his own. You know, mm. he was, uh, it just wasn't his cup of tea at all, really. Um, so getting to talk to him that first time, uh, you know, it, it did take me a while to figure him out, you know, just in terms of his, the way he expresses himself, his speech patterns, his thought processes and so on. But what I found was somebody who was amazingly uh, open and um, humble. You know, that's one of the recurring words about uh, Charlie was that he was just, and it's not one of those things you can put on, I don't think. He was just a very genuinely humble man. I think we'd all agree Absolutely. on that. You know, modest, um, <clears throat> not shy. I think there's a distinction. He wasn't, I wouldn't say that he was a shy man because he was very, um, you know, uh, knew, he knew who he was but that was not a rock star. He knew that he wasn't a rock star. He didn't want to be part of that world at all, I don't think. So uh, a contradiction in many ways. And, mm. and Dave, you, f uh, you first met us when you were children, really, but um, Charlie was a great collector. I mean, one of the world's great collectors of both literature and music stuff. When did you first sort of see his collector gene um, uh, showing itself? Well, we, we grew up together and we, we discovered jazz together. And we used, when we were kids, oh, I was about 10 or 11, you know, we used to go to local record shops and browse through the 78s and pick out 78s and I'd, I'd buy one and he'd buy one. And that, that's how it started. And, um, and, and we both, it was amazing, we both ran in tandem. Both, Lee, both of us discovered jazz together and that grew as the years went by, you know. Um, I, 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 later on, uh, Charlie actually accumulated a lot of LPs, which I couldn't afford. <laughs> but um, we, we used to live, live next door to each other, and we used to go to each other's bedrooms and play our records and this stuff. And um, later on, I acquired a double bass, and Charlie got the drums, and we joined a local jazz band together. So the whole thing was, almost 
in the stars, you know, we both uh, went the same direction. I remember talking to him about books and talking to him about his jazz collection because, I mean, now I think that um, jazz culture is much more mainstream than it was then. But he said it was much harder to find signed um, th and, and things that were great at the jazz age because they hadn't had so much value. They'd been chucked mm. away. It wasn't, you know, whereas things of the Beatles or whatever, or the Rolling Stones, everybody was, you know, they would sure. be easy to get, but they hadn't had the same value placed on them at the time, mm. yeah. which perhaps they do now. So he got some e extraordinary things, both pictures and, and books and everything. When did you first realise he, his interest in books, Dave? I didn't know that, actually. Not, not when we were kids, you know, when we were growing up. I, I only discovered that, well, I, m many years later, when he invited me over to his house in Chelsea. And uh, I was staggered because he had the entire collection of P.G. Woodhouse first editions, uh, English editions and American editions, which had different just jackets, you know. I, well, I couldn't believe it. And the whole, it was like a library. His lounge was like a library. And I, I, could, I was staggered by it. And they were all pristine copies and, and in individual cases. And I, I opened one, one of the cases. He said, have, have a look at one of them. You know, so I to open it up. I can't remember the title of it, 1937 edition of uh, the P.G. Woodhouse book. And it was, I won't tell you the price of it, but uh, <laughs> you had the price written on it. And, um, but it was, it was extraordinary. I didn't know the extent of his collecting. I, I had no idea, uh, really. As, you know, he, never, he never spoke about it. But you can see the value or the respect that he had for all these collections. I mean, yeah. it's, it's on display here today, and those books are all in yeah. good, gorgeous look. Like yeah. Mint he would, don't they? yeah, he would ring me up occasionally uh, to say that I, he'd got a, a signed Charlie Parker LP, mm. you know, Oh, guess what I got? I got a Charlie Parker LP from New York, you know. Oh, fantastic. He, was, he, he, he wasn't bragging about it. He was just he was, he was thrilled about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. I remember him excited so. about it, you know. Yeah. When he, uh, he, I remember he said to me one time that he, when, when the Stones first got to the States, and Keith said this in, in, to me, that, you know, he never, Charlie never expected to make it to America, you know. So when he, when he went there, his first priority was to go to Birdland or to the yeah. clubs. And the that he dreamed of, and the, and the record shops, yeah, yeah. And, and I guess antique shops, because he was already such a collector of um, antique guns, was, was an early yeah, one I for him, wasn't it? No, <laughs> yeah, but I think that is quite an early one from, yeah. you know, that first trip in 64. Mm. He spent as much time looking for, you know, all the others are probably hanging out and doing more, um, you know, usual musical pursuits, but he's sort of there in antique shops and rummaging around for, you know, for his collections. Yeah, before yeah. that tour, he actually, I remember he asked me, is there anything you want mm. me to bring back for you, record-wise? Yeah. So he, he brought me back an American copy of an Eric Dolphy quintet LP, yeah. which was got gold dust, you know, it was fantastic. Mm. And Pristine. I think that's the thing about a lot of the things in this sale, they're, they're, they're collected with great love and affection. They're not like sort of just, he's got it because he really loves the thing, you know. Yeah. And, but also he's definitely got the collector's gene because I would say, you know, oh. we'd both be obsessed with auctions and what's, what's happening there. Yeah. And then he, and uh, I've picked this one out only because it is interesting because it's catalogued mm. as uh, 78 signed by um, Count Basie. But I think it's interesting because the really important thing about this is, and I remember him saying this at the time, he couldn't believe it because he got the 78 signed by Count Basie, but more importantly, signed by the entire orchestra. Now, yeah. if you think the, to get the four Beatles to sign something, that's relatively easy <laughs> but at the time because they were all the Rolling Stones. There was five of them. And it's, the it's the like, entire big band is a bit more The whole big band, you know, one of them will have always been sort of out of the room or got in a taxi or fallen asleep. To get the lot <laughs> is so rare and yeah. so captures that moment perfectly. And in fact, um, when we played in Vienna, which we used, mm. we used to play in quite a bit, we, in the Boogie mm. Woogie, um, yeah. uh, exhibition yeah, that we yeah, would do. Yeah. We would go to Vienna, and he told us about. He told me about that Tuchler record shop where mm. they sold seventy eight. He said, "Go in, tell them I sent you, and they'll send you upstairs." And I went to this shop in Vienna, it specialised yeah. in jazz records. It's still there. And the father, the, the, the two boys run it called Tuch Tuchler Brothers. Their elderly mother and their and the and their great and the grandfather. Yes. 
just he he sold seventy eight uh, blues and jazz ones, and after the war, when uh, in the fifties, when LPs had come, and he hadn't sold them cheap like everybody else, he said they're going to be worth something. So they had this upstairs room, That's right. and you had to go at the back of the room, go up the stairs like where the resistance would have hidden, past a sort of. A, I, went, I went up there with Charlie. Yeah, this yeah. weird <laughs> person smoking a fag, and you went into a room like Miss Havisham's room and opened the curtains. And there's all these 78s. Yeah. But only he would have known that. Yeah. You yeah. know, who yeah. else? <laughs> I know. Yeah. You know, Charlie said, oh, yeah, you've got around the place. <laughs> Didn't you tell me that he, he told you about it and then said, come back tomorrow? And they. they well, we went, we, the first time up. we went there, we, 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 it, it, it took us up this dark room, and thousands and thousands of 78s. But it was a mess, total mess. Mm. It was piles of papers on the floor, and dust everywhere. You know, nobody had been up there for years. So he said, so the son, Christian, the son said, Come back tomorrow. I'll tidy it up for you. So he came back, and it was pristine. He must have been up all night, you know, moving his stuff around. You know, it was fantastic. We spent the day there, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was. It, well, I think it was the hunt as well. He liked was was looking for things. Wasn't mm. it? Mm. Chase. Yeah. The, uh, and and because it was much harder to get. You know, it's it's because it was so. Um, it didn't have the same value as it has now. When people realise it's sort of the most important cultural thing of the sure. 20th century. Mm. Um, be very careful. If you have a 78, by the way, it is made of shellac, which means it can crack. So I'm putting it down very gently <laughs> there. But one of the important things, Jules, I know you told me this, was that um, when you were talking about those, anything that he bought, either from that shop or anywhere else, most of them remained unplayed, didn't they? Yeah, he didn't, mm. because that would be spoiling it to actually play the to records. Play the record. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they, were mint. they were mint. They yeah. were new records. Yeah, yeah they've been purchased years ago. Yeah, but, and they were just all new. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, in with a record like this, I remember him saying to me, "So, in I don't know what year this record is, maybe 1949 or something. But in 1949, in sort of May or whatever, it's the Count Basie Orchestra all signed there. They go in." record it, and then, you know, by a couple of months later, it comes out on this shellac. So, the, so you're right next to, you're, you're the closest copy you can have, like when you get a, a Rembrandt print of, in his lifetime at the right, you know, a Dura print. That's what this is. It's not like a one done years later, or a record, or a CD, or something, or an LP. This is as close as you can get to the original Absolutely, yeah. thing. So it's really yeah. of stuff that's kind of iconic. I mean, he, uh, 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 much loved by him, and um, sort of fascinating things. And uh, what about the books? Did he ever discuss the books with you? He, you know, he never did really. I mean, that's a, another measure of how private he was. I think it's partly because w whenever I saw him, um, he was in work mode. And often that would be, if we were talking about a Stones album, I mean, you know, he would be wheeled out somewhat reluctantly to talk about the new album or the next tour or whatever. Um, and then, of course, as I look back on this, it's with some great affection but some regret because you know you just wish there'd be more time to carry on those conversations mm -hmm. for longer but uh, obviously even when you get the kind of access that I've been lucky enough to have you know your time finishes and then they're on to the next one and that's sort of it until the next time but also it's a measure of how private he was the, the thing I always noticed was that a conversation with Charlie about jazz was so completely different from a conversation about the Stones mm, record. Mm, you know, he, he loved the Stones loved it, as, yeah. as a thing, but he w didn't really want to talk about his own involvement. He didn't, you know, he, he loved the, the Stones music at the point of creation in the studio. That's what he always said to me. And then he never really listened to it after that, you know, and he was quite sort of almost dismissive about it. Mm. I remember he said to me one time, one of my favorite quotes about that was he said, um, we, I, I interviewed them one time in, in well, several times actually, when they were rehearsing in Toronto, they used to rehearse in Toronto. And he said, um, "When I'm here uh, with the band uh, re rehearsing, is the only time I know the Rolling Stones catalogue. Apart from that, I've forgotten it." <laughs> and he, right. he almost said it proud. Exactly. And I think that was the whole uh, the thing, wasn't it? I think he did also say that he'd spent, um, you know, this was like sort of uh, not long before he died. He said he'd spent like sort of. Um, really uh, three years working with the Rolling Stones and 40 years just hanging, hanging about. around. Hanging around, yeah, um, the famous and, quote. And I think that that, and I think to maybe stave off the madness of hanging, because there was a lot of hanging yeah. around. If they go on world tours, it just went on. I would join them for a bit. It would just go on and on, these same huge suites, right. this whole sort of huge sort of um, circus on the road going from place to place, but in some ways quite sort of similar, you know, another suite in the Four Seasons, another whatever it is here, and now we'll wait to go out of the stadium. And to sort of keep yourself sort of sane through all of that, I think focusing on great literature and acquiring it, yeah. so it's like Christmas when you get home, is actually really kind of brilliant way of, of, um, 
of sort of dealing with the whole thing. I yeah. think also when you're talking about where he didn't play the, the records, just as a, as a sort of thing of his character, where he wanted, which I would like to say, which is where he, because he was a perfectionist, but not a perfectionist where it was difficult if it didn't work, because he, be, he used to say to us, right, let's plan it like that. He said, and we'll end up doing it different anyway, but it would be more authentic then, you know, <laughs> yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, that's it. But he did, one time, we went, when we played in one of those shows in that little town, Bad Ischl, beautiful little theatre in the sort of Austrian countryside, and he and I were having dinner, and we started talking about cars. I said, have you got cars, Charlie? He said, yeah, yeah, I've, I have. He said, actually, I've got this very nice 1930s, it was like an Auburn or a Cadillac, 1930s convertible car. I said, oh, how lovely. Legon Legondo, I think. Was it a Legondo? Yes, that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. He said, I said, oh, yeah. that's lovely. I said, he, said, he said, as a matter of fact, I've just had it retrimmed. he said, because I bought, um, he used to buy the suits, they fitted him perfectly. It was of Edward, the, uh, the, the one who abdicated, the eighth, yeah. 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 Uh, he right. said, and I had this material, it was so nice, I've had the car retrimmed in it. I said, it's absolutely beautifully retrimmed. He said, oh, what a lovely thing. He said, yeah, I'm really, really pleased with that. He said, and then we were talking about cars, I said, oh, I had this old Rolls Royce. He said, oh, I have one of those, a Chinese armor. I said, he, he said, yeah, that one, we did this, and I did that. Too. I said, so would you drive them up and down? And we, but we'd, we'd had maybe half an hour more over dinner, just talking about cars. I said, would you drive that one up and down? He said, no, I don't drive. I haven't got a driving license, never driven in my life. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's great. That's a motoring conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very, very modest and shy. Not sh him, shy as a It was the thing, it was an it, artifact. It yeah. was a thing of yeah. beauty just to sit in. Yeah, he, right. he, he, sit in it. he loved the shape of old cars. Yeah. 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 He it's, loved the wood and the leather and, you know, yeah. the whole thing. He's an, an, a, a great aesthete. I think he enjoyed being chauffeured around too, didn't he? He, <laughs> it, he did it, like, it, 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 I know yes. you told me one time about it, you, you saw the car going by, didn't you, when you were on the way That's to right. Ronnie's or Old something? Old Compton Street. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he was in the back, away, but he didn't see me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking down the street. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that was the thing, that he really was a great collector. I think, only because I remember him talking as well, thinking about the things here. There's a great map, uh, not a map, a sort of thing on rollers, an amazing thing um, of the great, there's the bio tapestry, it's, it's on which is just in there. Oh, there yeah. And I do remember him talking, he said, I've got this thing, it's really fantastic. What is it? It's the bio tapestry, <laughs> really? Yeah, but it's on a thing, and you can see the whole thing. It's unbelievable, the way that it's been made. <laughs> It's just the most incredible thing. And, um, and I said, what are you going to do with that? And I, oh, I don't know. <laughs> don't know. Love of that. But really pleased with it, though. <laughs> what an incredible thing, you know. But all, yeah, th 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 there's some amazing things here. He used yeah. to dig very deep, didn't he? He's collecting. Yes. You yeah. know, he, he, he wasn't a shallow collector. It was a proper... He, he really go into, you know, and, and, yeah. Cole course. Porter's lyrics or, you yeah. know, Charlie Parker's written music. And later on, in later years, of course, having done all that digging himself to start with, he would have people to look out for things yes. Yes. for him and a, a, a wish list, I'm sure. Absolutely you know, right, yeah. certain yeah. Thing, he was he? very kind. He gave me, and which he explained to me, he said, uh, he said I'm, I've got this, it's Fats Waller, but it's really good because he signed it. If he really means it, he signs it Thomas oh, yeah. Fats Waller, because that's his real name. And he gave me this lovely playbill from the Finsbury Park Empire, 1937, with Fats oh. Waller in it. It was such a nice thing. Wonderful. And uh, it was, he was a very kind fellow because he said, oh, it doesn't fit my collection because I like, I like to have signed photographs. But then at the memorial, there was a f the book dealer was there. He said, no, he asked me to find something especially for you. So it, well, he, yes. he just, just very kindly gave it to uh, me, pretended it wasn't, didn't suit yes. his, his thing. Glenn, you know? uh, that's right, Glenn yeah. from Peter Harrington, I think. Yeah, it was, was Peter Harrington. He was searching for stuff on. Mm. Yeah. And he, gave, he was so generous with me. You know, he gave me books, a complete collection of the South Polar Times. Yeah. You know, it suddenly turned up in the Because he knew you were interested Because in he knew I was interested yeah. in polar yeah. exploration. Yeah. And he, you know, he thought, yeah. oh, I'll give this to David. <laughs> yeah, and it was yeah. great. And it was also the other thing I think which was great about him, before we go into the questions, is it was all done with very good humour. Yes. He had, he had, it was an underlying humour about the things. He, yeah. he could see the, the funny side of things. It was very dry sometimes, yeah. but he could yes. see that the. the um, but yeah. he had, you said to me, he had, I mean, it's just somebody with a huge natural, natural curiosity. Yes. For, Mm. For the world around him, you know, and that's part of it. Yeah. And I, I also think he was addicted to the idea of collectability. Anything that was collectible, he was in, yeah, wasn't he? Exactly. He was a completist. Yeah. Yes. A completist. Yeah. A completist, that's right. And <clears throat> also had that optimism that all collectors have, that I'll go around and look around a junk shop because I'm going to find that. You never know, I just might find yeah. that extra, the last bit of the jigsaw or whatever mm. it is. Mm. Um, so I think, would anybody like to sort of ask um, us some questions? I think we have people uh, with microphones that will lunge at you. Gentleman at the front here. There's a gentleman here. Yeah, just, uh, I mean, I'm not 
not aware of the, the total collection that Charlie collected, but uh, I am curious to know which drum kits you might have. I think there's a Gene Krupa drum kit, maybe Chick Webb and so on. Would you know which ones they are? Good question. Good question, yeah. I mean, there are, there are a lot. And there's a, a Max Roche, is, is that one? Yeah, he's, I think. He's, um, yeah, he's got an incredible drum collection, yeah. I mean, as you say, Gene Krupa, Max yeah. Roach. Yeah. He's yeah. got Davy Tufts snare drum. He's got big Sig Catlitz mm. cymbals. Mm. You know, it's quite incredible. Yeah. I saw the collection when it was in the lockup. Yeah. It's quite amazing, yeah. Yeah, I saw you with Steve Brown looking through, you know. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he got very excited. Yes. Yeah. 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 Quite, it's quite staggering. I said, when I was um, doing the book, I had one of the people, such as these gentlemen who were very helpful, was uh, Charlie's drum tech, Don McCauley. Um, and I, at one point, said half-jokingly, I think we were talking specifically about the drum kits, and I said these should be in a museum. And he, he very quietly said, they will be. Oh, great. Well, that's yeah. what Charlie wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was his idea. Yeah. yeah. And I think we agreed, much as he hate, hated fuss, of any kind, and I was mm. at the Stones album launch last week at Hackney Empire, which was fantastic, but I was sensing him looking down, thinking, what's all this nonsense, you know, about this? <laughs> Who, why does anybody care, kind of thing. Whereas, <laughs> today, I think he would be looking, thinking, this is kind of cool. Oh, actually. yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, being the subject of this. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, he would love it. Is there a person, did I see a hand, the gentleman oh, there? there? Yeah. Hi, Paul. Um, Hi. I wonder if you can talk a bit more about the Hi, relationship. Hi, <laughs> good to see you, mate. Uh, I wonder if you can talk a bit more about the relationship between the music and the books and the fact that the collection largely derives from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Yeah. The kinds of books, Dashiell Hammett, uh, noir fiction, jazz, uh, and as, uh, as somebody said, uh, the, 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 the Scott Fitzgerald book, is the definition of the jazz age. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the, the, the relationship between those two things? Yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, we, we were talking about it the other day on the phone, weren't exactly. we? And, and I th my, my feeling on that is that the jazz collection came first, or the, the interest in jazz came first, back mm -hmm. there when you were what? I mean, you were barely teenagers, were you, yeah, when that yeah. first exactly. developed? 10 or 11. Um, yeah. So it feels like it was the jazz collection that, that then informed the, the, the book collection, and, but with an almost subconscious um, awareness of, of style in, in both cases. There is a, you know, you can draw a line, I think, or a parallel between the, the, the innate style of all of the jazz records that you both loved mm. and um, the, the innate style of, of the sort of literature that he was drawn to. You know, and obviously, in some cases with the literature, you're digging back even further, um, as you say, into the 20s. But this just seemed to be a, an instinctive thing with him. You know, it was... Mm. It's not like buying something because it's cool or because it, it's just he knew what he wanted and all of those uh, writers, um, uh, uh, same as all of those musicians, had that unspoken um, tastefulness about them. I don't think, I'm not sure he would have ever analyzed that too much. It just was there in but his I, I, subconscious. I you know? think it's a very good point that they're all things of the jazz age. Yeah. You know, the car that he never drove, yeah. the, 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 the books, mm. you know, it, it, even if they're very English, they're still part of the jazz age, that sort of, and that sort of, um, that mm. sensibility. Yeah. Which, uh, Having said that, I mean, certainly when it came to music, I had some interesting conversations with him. It wouldn't be right to say that he was locked into that era exclusively. No. I mean, he, you know, when we talked about modern music, he was very disapproving of a lot of it, but he was a massive fan of Prince, for example. Absolutely loved Prince, you know, mm. and Michael Jackson in his heyday, you know, and other people like that. So he was not time locked in, in that way. Mm. And also he had a great, I mean, I think the other thing is they did have, I mean, all the Rolling Stones had an incredible social circle of people that were around, that Charlie was very modest about, but they always had like very interesting people from all walks of yeah. the arts, the literature, around them all the time. That's right. The living ones, you yeah. know, so, um, uh, which again, he was very modest about. Mm. But I think these, the, the, the books and the jazz records were part of a living thing in his life, where they're, you know, Rolling Stones were the center of attention and the center of a cultural world that was sort of going on. And, and, and so all of those people from the, from the 60s on, you know, when you'd be on tour with them, writers and artists, um, some very and musicians would come and, and visit them. They, you know, oh, we'll go and pay homage to, um, um, and they'd always want to see 
um, uh, Charlie, you know. So it was, he was part of a world. It wasn't like he was just an observer. He was, mm. he was actually in it, um, making his own history. But he didn't ever feel that the stone, I mean, much as I said before about him being very proud of the stones, you know, collectively, um, he, I don't think he felt, he was so down to earth that he, he never would say that they were part of that cultural revolution themselves. You know, I think he, he was modest. The other thing which he did do was all the Rolling Stones, um, when they're, they're, which I think a lot of the literature, like we're talking about the jazz age, but the, the, and the things that would inspire him, that with uh, Mick Jagger, it was really the two of them that would design the stage shows. Yeah. And on those uh, stadium shows, for instance, the, I think the idea of the huge platform that would come out and Mick would walk to the end of it bridge, sing, yes, yeah. the bridge thing, which was mm -hmm. a whole, Bridges to Babylon, mm -hmm. which was a whole, nobody had done that before. And the way that it all looked, that Charlie, because he'd been a graphic designer with Mick, that was, the, the, that was very much the thing they worked on together. Yeah. And I think that a lot, lot of, you know, the, the, the books and his art sensibility, that, that all was all part of the, the same thing. We have any other uh, questions? There's a person just the, the, just there with their hand. Just somebody's coming to you. Hi guys, thank you. Um, we, we know the Stones and Charlie um, got to meet some of the blues heroes and got to play with them and sort of reintroduce them to you know audiences in America and and the uh, and the UK. But did Charlie ever get to meet any of his big jazz heroes? And what was that like for him? I think he did. I mean, the one that stays in my mind on those, not necessarily as a household name in, in, in quite the same way as some of the people you may be referring to, but Chico Hamilton was, was one. Yes. He, Chico oh, came to the, yeah. the gig at the Bruno in right. New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is somebody that uh, he, I think, am I right that Chico played on? Walking Shoes. Walking Shoes, the Jerry Mulligan track, which is, That's as right. you know, better than anybody. Was, this, right. was his first record or his one first, of the very first, first 78, bought, 78 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that would have been in the, where are we now? I mean, the, 52 that was yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and i think he met you know was it 93 yeah. or something like that so yeah. 35 whatever yeah. it is yeah. years later yeah. yeah i know he was gobsmacked at the idea of meeting so mm. i think they recorded there was a recording that they were on together i believe but um oh really yeah i think so oh, I didn't know um that. yeah so that's an example of him uh, you know i always felt that he was he never thought of himself as as the equal of any of those musicians he, he talked himself down so much as a as a musician you know you couldn't really pay him a compliment he just sort of bat it yeah. away or change the he, subject. He went, he went on that um, public service broadcasting uh, jazz mm. uh, jazz program yeah. in New York yeah. uh, with Tim Rice, yeah. who was the tenor player in, in the Stones. Tim Reese. Tim Reese, sorry, yeah. Tim Reese. Yeah. And um, uh, Charlie said, <laughs> through the program, he said, I shouldn't be here, I'm a charlatan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, what am I doing on this jazz program? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's you right. Know, you said you know, to me, you know, I should have, learned, should have learned properly, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think as well, the fact that he did, we did, I remember him saying to me, or it came up at one point, it would, he would, he felt very strongly how badly a lot of the musicians who he admired had been treated, mm. either through racism or through, you know, the, the disadvantages they'd had, and, and also the, the, you know, the bad contracts and all of, all of that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and I think he did use to say, and he said to me, you know, we, we've, we've had it so good. Um, yeah. And they did, he contributed a lot to the Blues Foundation and all that, they used to support mm. the, the, the musicians. I, was, I always felt that he was, ha he was comfortable spending his own money, partly because he was so generous with other people. So, he, you know, I yeah. think it, it made me feel okay to spend money on all of these amazing artifacts because he was also simultaneously spending a fortune on gifts for his friends. Sure, I made that a chapter in the book or a sub, yes, sub chapter because you know, everyone had a story, the rest of the, you know, Mick, Keith and Ronnie and Bill, um, all of his friends had stories, including yours, you know, about well, how amazingly yeah. generous he was yeah, yeah. and hand-picked gifts, you know, I mean, costing a fortune. Mm. He mm. spent so long actually finding, yeah. you know, specifically. Any other hands that would like to go? There's two hands there, gentlemen there, and another gentleman just over there. I wonder if you could speak a little more about his sense of personal style and if any of his uh, immaculate Savile Row suits will ever come up for sale. Well, that's a good Ooh. point. He did say that he was, it turned out to be physically exactly the same size as 
Is that with the eighth? Yeah, with the eighth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with the eighth. So he did buy quite a lot of his things. He did. Yes. And he would then have them adjusted and have things made like that. Yeah. Um, he, no, so, that's right. He heard that that stuff was, was going to become available, didn't he? And got yeah. very excited about it. Yeah. Um, um, but he was immaculately turned out always um, and uh, would carefully think about what he was going to wear when he went out for a walk or whatever. He was happened. always like that. From yeah. The, very right. early yeah. age. Um, yeah. Impeccably yeah. Um, yeah. turned out. There's that photo. Mm -hmm. Of you and in the uh, pub, in the pub, in yeah, yeah, with Joe Jones in Edgware, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm wearing an old cardigan, old cardigan, cardigan and shirt. Yeah. And he's got his immaculate with his Ivy League Ivy jacket. <laughs> jacket on. Yeah, you know. actually, the other one, the one I love of that is from even earlier. Is that photo which did um, do the rounds when Charlie passed away, which was him with his parents in I think it's Trafalgar Square. They're feeding the pigeons, I think, and he's he's. Like oh, two, yes. year, two years old, I think. It's 1940. Oh, that's it. Yeah, Uxbridge, actually. Uxbridge, that is. Oh, is yeah. it? Yeah, it is, oh, okay. Yeah. I've mis misinterpreted yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, anyway, yeah, he's, yeah. he's out with his parents, but he's wearing a gorgeous sort of half right. coat Fantastic. and a beret. And a beret. <laughs> that's right. Wonderful shot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> shot. But yeah. he did He did say, he told me once, because I think there was a, a Duke Ellington suit for sale. And there's the Duke Ellington piano was for sale first. And I said, and it, but it never, there was no pictures of Duke with it. And it was just this old sort of beaten up piano. And I said, oh, well, it, you know, it was, the provenance wasn't all that good. You know, Charlie, I didn't want to buy. And I thought he's, he's the only person I know who would sort of know what this, you know, what, what the sort of right thing to, to ask and the look, things to look for. I said, and there was no photographs of Duke with the piano. So I thought, well, I don't know. So he said, where was it? I said, well, it, he said it was in his bedroom. And then he'd given it to the sort of housekeeper or whatever. He said, oh, the famous piano where he'd jump out of bed if he was having a dream and just play something on the piano and the, and the magic would come to you. That's a famous, oh, I missed that one then. But then, uh, but then I said, oh, well, I, I, I saw a frame again. I said, oh, hey, so one of Duke Ellington's suits has come up. Maybe I should buy that. He said, well, one, he said it wouldn't fit you because you're a different size to him altogether. He said, but two, and this is only Charlie would have known this, Duke Ellington was very superstitious. So if a button came off of a suit, he'd throw it away. Just one button came off that, so you wouldn't replace the button. Just that's the end of the suit. He said, so there's loads of Duke Ellington suits for sale. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what I mean. He was a proper collector and yeah. the knowledge, you know, if you, whatever yeah, you, if you really yeah, was. it was the knowledge that he had, which yes. was, was, was great. There was somebody here that had a, a, a question. Um, apart from the actual Holy Grail itself, what was his most elusive thing? What was the one thing that Charlie really wanted to get hold of? Ooh. Sorry. No, that's a good question. I, I mean, I do remember him talking about this, this record. But I mean, I think each as each as each acquisition came, he got very excited about it. Mm. You know, but having something like those big bands, getting everybody to sign, it was so sort of so difficult. You know, I mean, having a big band myself, it's impossible to get everybody to sign mm. something. Um, so I don't know what the. Um, he loved Charlie. He thought he loved Charlie Parker with strings. That was one of the records we first yes, listened to. Charlie and I don't Parker know if did strings. he have an acid take of that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. He may have actually. Yes, yeah. he may have. It's a good. Yeah. That's a good question. But I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. You know. I think yeah. he loved all the different things. But mm. which, you know, which was, which was particularly he was particularly most fond of. Well, I guess it would be something Parker related. Probably. Yeah. Charlie Parker was his big love. Yeah. And anything related to Charlie Parker. I mean, in in the. Uh, in the room over there, he's got these little notes and yeah. to his wife and uh, oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? You know, yeah. and little cards with you know. yeah, little cards and stuff like that. Yeah. Very personal things. Yeah, yeah. anything to, related to Charlie Parker, yeah. he loved. You know, yeah, yeah. Actually, thinking about it, just it was quite just summing up his character. He gave me a book about Pete Johnson, the pianist, which is incredibly rare, which he got from Peter Harrington. Incredibly rare book, just couldn't get it. It's a little thin book. And I opened it and it had been inscribed and it just said to Jules, nice book about, uh, enjoy this nice book. Uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, yours, Charlie, brackets, drummer, Rolling Stones. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah, yeah. But it was, I like the brackets. He did that with yeah, me yeah, as well. Yeah, 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 yeah no, I, I yeah, yeah. Every, every time. <laughs> I've got exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> Very charming. To avoid any confusion. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Have we got any other people ask a question, I think? Hi. Hello. It's about that book collection out there, which is the stuff of dreams. Did he <laughs> read them? And if so, do you know if he had a favorite? Good question. Did he read the? Did he read the he books? Definitely read them. Is, yeah. Yes, he read them. But did he have a favourite? Do you know of the books? I, I don't know about that. I, Woodhouse I, I was, think, the, was the was the writer that I, I, in the on the rare occasions where it came up. Yeah. That he mentioned, but I don't. Know I got the feeling was, he just he, he had them. Yeah. I don't think he read them. I I can you know, confirm I just think he the, won, 
you know. Sorry to interrupt, but um, he did have reading copies, I believe, of a lot of the books, oh. so that he didn't mm. damage the spines. Okay. So okay. I believe he he did read them all. Yes. yes. In fact, I, that's right. absolutely right because he said that to me once. Because okay. he said, he, I said, oh, I quite like books. He said, oh, you have the collector's one and the reading copy. I said, what? Yeah. I didn't even know what that was. But that's what I exactly the yeah. reading copy. Yeah, but reading also, copy, yeah. he would buy a book, and then if if he later saw a better version of that book, yeah. he he would buy that and mm. replace it. He wouldn't keep them both he would, so he's always looking to improve on the collection yeah. mm. that's why it's so unique yeah exactly yes. exactly yes now, incredible books and i think and i think he found great pleasure in the fact that the way the authors had inscribed them in a very specific way they hadn't just it wasn't just to anybody it was they, it was to somebody they they were close to which i think was an important part of it yeah constantly trading up has anybody else got a any other questions I was absolutely fascinated by the dedication in The Great Gatsby, referencing Gatsby and appearing to come from uh, Alcatraz prison. <laughs> I wondered if anybody had a bigger story on that. The dedication of The Great Gatsby is very often. I, I don't, I'm afraid. I mean, I'm sure that would have been one that no. Peter Harrington would have, uh, you know, mm. his, yeah, his I know that. collectors would have uh, got for him. I can tell you on the tour, if you're willing to wait. <laughs> um, but yes, I mean, the, I'll give a little hint now. The, the inscription in, in the copy of The Great Gatsby uh, reads, to the original Gatsby of this story with thanks for letting me reveal the secrets of his past. Um, the most amazing inscription. And then, as you say, it does go on to suggest that it was written in Alcatraz, but that was his sort of code name for his uh, writer's office when he was a Hollywood script writer. <laughs> um, and then I think it also says, remember me to the mob and, you know, that sort of thing. Fitzgerald, uh, um, and it was given to a man called Harold Goldman, who was a, uh, a script writer in Hollywood alongside Fitzgerald in the late 1930s. It's unclear whether they knew each other before, uh, you know, 1925, when Gatsby was, was, was published and written. So whether he was the original inspiration for Gatsby, you know, that perhaps that's, that, that can be um, in question, but certainly he saw in his friend Harold Goldman, some sort of parallel with Jay Gatsby, you know, with his most iconic literary character, and that's what makes this so special. There's some amazing things here. Um, uh, and I think one of the most amazing things is that it's, you know, some collectors, they, this is a collector who really was a proper collector, wasn't he? He was a person who really loved what he did and spent mm. his, and had, and was in the strange situation of being on tour and having loads of time mm. being around the world where you could collect stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, you Actually, know, was, before we finish, you was to say a, a big uh, uh, recognition to Charlie's daughter, Serafina. Yes. And her husband, Barry, who were so helpful to me for the book, but also for, I know, were instrumental in, in, in this happening, you know? Yeah. And, mm. um, which always is very emotional because you know this is all happening still quite quite close to yes. his, his passing and mm. uh, I think and his granddaughter Charlotte as well. Who... Yes, no, they've done a great. It's been it's been hard for them and they've done yeah. a, a wonderful job. Yeah. Um, actually, just going back to what you was, the, the gentleman who was asking about his suits. That's what I was going to say at the memorial. I just remember we had there was a little memorial thing in the, in Ronnie Scotts, which the family organised. But uh, Mick Jagger said that he went round to a party at Charlie's at one point because he said he really enjoyed sort of nice clothes and, and he was dressed as Henry VIII. <laughs> um, so he quite liked historic costumes as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but I don't think that's in the sale at the moment. I'm sure you can get your own one if you needed it. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and thank you, Paul, and thank you, Dave. <laughs>